people like me. You need people like me so you can point your fing fingers and say that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. The ongoing fallout in reference to the Anthony Joshua versus Tyson Fury fights collapse. George Warren, the son of Frank Warren, has now confirmed that Tyson Fury versus Anthony Joshua is off. It fell down because, quite frankly, we got to a point where communication coming back from them was lacking. There was no ambition on their side to help me try and keep the thing going. And, you know, how are they supposed to do that when the fighter, the fighter you promote, the fighter they're supposed to be fighting, keeps imposing deadlines? I mean, the Monday deadline, the Wednesday deadline. There's always a certain level of cognitive dissonance with all things Tyson Fury. Always. George Warren isn't acknowledging that it was Tyson Fury imposing time constraints and deadlines that really weren't necessary. At the end of the day, you let your team negotiate the fight while you prepare to fight. All that stuff about a Monday deadline, a Wednesday deadline. Deadline. Calling the fight off. Who was responsible for that? Was that Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua? Or was that your fighter, Tyson Fury? There is always a certain level of cognitive dissonance with all things Tyson Fury. I don't think it's a blame game. My assumption is they as a group, AJ's reps, just decided for whatever reason they didn't want to engage last week to try and get this over the line, which is disappointing. And I suppose Tyson Fury's announcement on Wednesday that the fight was off, I suppose that had nothing to do do with it. Manuel Char. So it seems now that AJ's finally out, he's ducked his way out in a shitbag, coward, and you're the man he wants to fight. So I like that. I like the fact that you're very vocal and the fact that you're calling for a fight like a real man should do. Any man who wants to fight another man should call him out, as you've been doing to me. So I accept your challenge, Manuel Char. Let's get it on, motherfucker! You know what Tyson Fury does? He pollutes the timeline, the chronology of a situation with so much utter bullshit, so much nonsense, he hopes to make the waters murky. Confuse people. Because while he was uploading videos like that one to his social media behind the scenes, Eddie Hearn and George Warren were said to be ironing out a deal and that was confirmed on both sides. George Warren, he doesn't mention any of that, the Monday deadline, the Wednesday deadline. You won't see George Warren mention that or Simon Jordan at Talk sport or Gareth Davies or Big Daddy Bunce, who expressed discontent that all of this was playing out publicly when the only one who made it public, the only one who made it a public affair, was Tyson Fury. So why don't you just say that? Why don't you just call him out by name instead of being indirect and casting the blame on everyone else? It was Tyson Fury that made this public and took it to the public for a smear campaign, I've no doubt. This is all about public perception. You don't need to run a smear campaign on someone that doesn't have an audience, that doesn't have a consumer base, a paying public. You don't need to run a smear campaign on someone who doesn't have an audience, but Anthony Joshua does. That's what this is. They want to turn Anthony's fans against him and turn them into Tyson Fury fans. That's what this whole smear campaign is all about because you don't run a smear campaign in the first place. And never mind that you guys are chasing around a guy who's coming off of two consecutive losses. Never mind that, but you know what? What? You don't run a smear campaign against someone who doesn't have an audience. Why would you? There's nothing to smear. Who are you gonna slander and smear his image to if he has no audience? But Anthony has an audience and that's what you're after. That's what you want. And that's what this smear campaign is all about. Why is Big John Fury still ranting and raving about a Joshua fight? Eddie Ed. I'm gonna put this to bed finally with the Eddie Ed and the AJ situation and my son. You know, yes, Eddie, you've stopped the biggest fight in British history happening. Oh, that was Eddie that did that. It wasn't your son. Your son last week on camera calling the fight off because Frank Warren said he's running out of patience. Through no fault of our own. Yeah, it's never the Fury's fault. It's never Tyson Fury's fault. Even when he's on camera calling the fight off,
himself. You know, he was offered everything 60-40. You know, and like I say. No, oh, he was offered 60-40. What are you so broken up about? AJ's not strapped for cash. He'll be all right. Some people just think they're cleverer than what they really are, you know. I'm not trying to be a clever man in any way, shape or form, because I know I'm not that clever. No education, but... Well, good. Because if this were your attempt at being clever, you'd be failing miserably. We saw what your son said last week. He was uploading videos all of last week. It's not me what's put the block on what the fans wanted. The biggest fight Britain have seen between Anthony Joshua and my son. Relax. You can always revisit the fight next year. It's not the end of the world. What are you so broken up about, John? We're not to blame, Eddie. Well, guys, it's official. D-Day has come and gone. You've done, you did all of this. It's gone past five o'clock Monday. On your own doing, mate. But listen. It's officially over for Joshua. What can you say? He is now out in the cold. We won't mention it no more. This is it. The final video about the Ains and the Joshuas. We'll not be concerned now ourselves with this anymore because it's out the window now. What's the line on both John Fury and Tyson Fury mentioning Anthony Joshua in the build-up of Tyson Fury's next fight? What are the odds? Any takers? It's a fight that never happened. Yep. I knew prevented it. Well, guys, it's official. D-Day has come and gone. Eddie Ayn. It's gone past five o'clock Monday. Enough said, eh? Peace out. Why so somber, John? Tyson Fury still got his belt. He's still got his O. Upward and onwards. On to bigger and better fights. Bigger and better things. I mean, why are the Furies so broken up about this? What are you getting bent out of sack for, baby? Anthony Joshua is a broken man. A beaten man. As so Tyson Fury himself so adequately, eloquently put it. You're raising this big stink because Tyson Fury can't fight a beaten man. If I didn't know better, I'd think it's you guys that feel like you missed the gravy train. It's you guys that missed the boat. Why wasn't John Fury uploading videos just like this one when his own son was the one calling the fight off? Last week, where was John? John? John, is that you? Are you there? John? Where is he? John. Where'd John go? John! <laughs> Let the smear campaign begin, because that's what this is. They want this to turn into a blame game. They want this to somehow, some way, in some way, shape, or form, involve Anthony Joshua so they have an excuse to keep talking about him and keep using his marquee value to sell Tyson's next fight. But I'm going to tell you something. No matter what reactions you get online, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Instagram, just that entire digital universe, it's not there where your focus should be. Your focus should be at the box office and selling a fight because you have a box office fight to sell. Bringing him up online incessantly might get a reaction online, but do you think that equates into dollars? You think you can get people to buy a char fight doing that? And just in keeping with the theme of all things heavyweight, current and former champions, former WBC champion Deontay Wilder on Anthony Joshua, I think he doubts himself a lot. I know what it takes to be a warrior, a killer, the energy, feel. I don't sense that from him. Physically, he can get everything done, but sometimes it's just that mental part. I take it that the regalia we saw in the second costume, Tyson Fury fight, the rhinestone costume, the car battery attached to Wilder's chest. The LED lights where his eyes should be. Is this guy supposed to be some kind of Power Ranger? He says he knows what it takes to be a killer. Yeah, seven years of stat padding. Avoiding all the top contenders in your era. Because Deontay Wilder, he debuted a very, very long time ago as a professional boxer. Well over ten years ago in 2008. And the subsequent seven years that followed, he wasn't fighting champions in top ten, divisional top ten contenders like Anthony was in his first three years as a pro in his first seven years as a pro is that what it takes to be a killer is that what it takes to be a warrior seven years of stat padding seven years of stat padding after having actually competed in the olympics and winning the bronze generally speaking amateur standouts and olympians especially ones that actually medal they don't stay on the bring along process that bring along path quite as long as Deontay stuck along that bring-along process, that bring-along path. I mean, seven years in boxing, that's a long time. Seven years and 32 professional fights? Yeah, that's a while. Deontay Wilder is always going to look at himself through a different lens than I or you look at him through, you understand? He's always going to look at himself with blinders on. He will never reflect on himself, his career. How Shelly Finkel categorized him as a baby after seven years in the pro ranks. 33 professional contests, 
being an unbeaten champion, his handlers, because he is a fighter, that is handle. His handled baby soft. No intentions to unify titles with Vladimir Klitschko after he became a champion. Shelly Finkel, who managed the career, still manages the career of Deontay Wilder, made it crystal clear that a Vladimir Klitschko fight, a unification match after seven years in the pro ranks, 33 professional contests, he was an unbeaten champion. After all of that, he still wasn't ready to stick him in there with Vladimir. So where Deontay Wilder would have guys like me and you believe that he's some kind of killer and he's got this killer mindset. All that was was creative matchmaking, opportunism and stat padding at its finest. You want to talk about lacking self-confidence? How confident was Deontay Wilder in the press conference ahead of the third Tyson Fury fight? The man came to the press conference with headphones on because he didn't want to engage anybody. He couldn't find his voice. He spent a year making wild accusations about Tyson Fury, wild accusations about Kenny Bayless, the referee, wild accusations about his own corner, Mark Breland. He even went as far as using certain content creators here on this platform to speak for him, to be his mouthpiece and propagate his conspiracy theory, rather, his excuses. Does any of that sound like something a killer would do? Someone who's confident? Someone with supreme mental fortitude? Press conference, he had nothing to say to the press there. Nothing to say to Christina Poncher. Any of the people in press row, he didn't want to talk to them. He didn't want to start talking until they isolated the environment, got him in his hotel room, and now he's sick back! You know what that guy likes to do? He loves to stroke the fighter's ego. While destroying stones in a glass house. He does that a lot. It's tell them age now. It's predictable. He says, I can see Anthony Joshua beating Tyson Fury. I know that's crazy. Some people would think so, but I could really see Joshua winning that fight. I think if he changes certain things mentally, he could come back and redeem himself more than ever. Well, you know, Anthony's on the rebound. The Fury fight fell apart. We just talked about that. And people are assuming that because he lost two fights to an Olympic gold medalist, a former undisputed cruiserweight champion, one of the most excellent boxers in the sport today, not just the division. People are acting like because he lost two fights to Oleksandr Yusik, he's cannon fodder for everyone else. There are a good number of heavyweights out there, good ones, that Anthony Joshua can still beat. There are a good number of fights out there that are interesting fights, marquee fights, because Anthony himself still has a lot of marquee value. His paying public doesn't hold it against him when he falters, when he fails, when he loses, because he consistently tries to fight the best fighters, Deontay Wilder included, that are out there. If Anthony Joshua wasn't trying to fight Deontay Wilder, then you explain it. You tell me why Deontay Wilder himself admitted they offered him more money to fight AJ than he stood to make fighting Fury. That sounds like a guy who was looking for a fight to me without turning the place into a goddamn circus. That's not necessary to make a big fight. It just isn't. That's more akin with what you see from Tyson Fury, whereas Anthony Joshua consistently fights in big fights and important fights, and whether he wins or he loses... He doesn't turn the place into a goddamn circus because he doesn't have to. Selling fights here, after all. Not storylines, narratives, sitcoms, or TV shows. This ain't the W. WWE. There's still a lot of fights left out there for him. Man, super middleweight news. Former two division champion Andre Vard said Golovkin literally just showed up to get a check against Canelo. And you know, it does kind of feel like either before the fight or during the fight, Gennady made a decision. He didn't want to take any chances. He wasn't going to be ambitious in the third fight. I thought Alvarez should have stopped that version of Golovkin. Vard said on Max Unboxing, if Canelo is who he says he is, an all-time great. You've got to take advantage of a fighter like that who literally just showed up to get a check. And while I did expect Canelo to stop today's version of Gennady myself, I don't begrudge him. Because I was expecting Canelo to stop Gennady too. That's a big part of the reason I tuned in. So I don't begrudge Canelo not stopping Gennady because Gennady is a guy who's never been stopped or even dropped as an amateur or a professional. Where it might seem like an indictment against Canelo from where I'm sitting, it might be a credit to Golovkin. The performance from Canelo was a little shocking. I thought he would do a little more, but the performance from Golovkin was not shocking. I was shocked by the reaction and the response that people finally got the revelation that he's looking old. He's looked old for the last two or three years, and because he's got the mantra of Mexican style, everybody excuses the fact that he takes way too many punches and way too much punishment. The response time and reaction weren't there. Golovkin has looked 40 for some time, and see that, that bit of it, 
I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. He didn't look 40 with Camille Zeremata. And even though he did look older and slower with Murata, and he did, he really did, he was still effective. He was still able to stop the bigger and younger fighter. I mean, I understand that Gennady Golovkin has looked older over the years, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's everybody's patsy or that he's some kind of pushover because, well, nobody's pushed him over. The only guy with a recorded win, recorded wins over Gennady Golovkin is Canelo Alvarez. So is it really an indictment against Canelo or a credit to Golovkin? Golovkin's durability and longevity, that he's still here and to date, Nobody stopped him, nobody's dropped him. Maybe people won't really appreciate Canelo's victory over Gennady until we see what Gennady does next. If you think about it, Alvarez is the biggest name, the only real name Golovkin has on his record. No matter how you feel about it, that's the truth, said War. Some ways it is, and some ways it isn't. Maybe a part of it is the truth, but not the whole truth. There was a time when there weren't any fighters in any hurry to fight Gennady. Except Andre Ward, who was going through promotional issues at that time, and took something like a two, two and a half year hiatus from the sport. You know, all that stuff that was going on. You know, Peter Quellen priced himself out of the fight, as did Billy Joe Saunders. He didn't come around to wanting to fight Gennady until much later on. Chris Eubank Jr. was supposed to fight him, but he lost his pen, pulled out of that fight. Brooks stood in his place. I remember when Lou DiBella described Gennady as an animal, an animal that he would keep Sergio Martinez away from. And I wouldn't begrudge Sergio for this if not for the fact that he was a reigning champion at the time. He was in possession of the WBC title, which he had no problem putting on the line against the naturally smaller Miguel Cotto, Miguel Cotto, who also avoided a Gennady Golovkin fight. I mean, I think it's a bit disingenuous to... Yeah, Gennady ain't got the greatest resume in the world, but when you think about how many fighters avoided him... Tell all story, why don't you? The way I look at it, Gennady Golovkin was definitely the best middleweight of his era. He was the most dominant force of his era because he unified the most titles in his era. While he doesn't have the most ambitious resume, there is something to be said about that. And Andre Ward's not saying it, that there were some fighters that avoided him. Sometimes it feels like you can't get an even assessment when it comes from Andre Ward. Whenever he's talking about Gennady, or whenever he's talking about Canelo, that he should have stopped the guy. Well, factor into the equation that Gennady's never been stopped. As a professional, as an amateur, he's never been dropped. So maybe it's easier said than done. And maybe we won't truly appreciate Appreciate Canelo Alvarez's latest victory over Gennady until we see Gennady in there with someone else and how he looks against them. Because if he wins... If he goes back to stopping, guys, well... That'll be a victory that ages well for Canelo.